be great if you could have your Bibles open at Luke chapter 18. Melchior Ben Isaac was a very rich, very successful businessman. He lived in a huge house on the shores of Tiberias, protected by high walls, security cameras, and a pack of seriously underfed Dobermans. He owned a yacht on the Sea of Galilee, anchored off a stretch of private fishing with magnificent views of the Golan Heights. Last year, Herod Antipas made him a local family judge, Mr. Justice Melchior, they called him. In truth, the title was a joke. Ben Isaac wasn't in the least bit interested in justice. He listened to money more than morality. He feathered his own nest with a vigour that would have impressed many a British banker. Anna, by contrast, lived in a slum on the wrong side of the tracks. After her young husband was shot in the Gaza Strip, her brothers had bribed the lawyers to do her out of her army pension. She'd been left with nothing. The house had been repossessed by the Tiberius Building Society, and the Galilean widow's life assurance had rejected her claim out of hand. Anna had no income, no child benefit, nothing with which to feed and clothe her young family. With no male protector, no status in society, life had become a daily struggle to survive. Anna was in desperate need of her husband's war pension, and that's why she turned to Mr Justice Melchior. Her first attempt to get an appointment failed because she couldn't afford to bribe his PA. So she pestered him every day. Every day for six months, jamming his direct line with her calls, filling his inbox with her emails, writing letters to the Tiberius Evening News. She waved a less than flattering placard at his every public appearance. Then there were rather those rather embarrassing occasions when she managed to cause a scene at the golf club and at one of those rather swish soirees aboard his yacht. At last, she wore him down. Things were getting from bad to worse, so finally he caved in and ruled in her favour. At last, Anna had the money that was rightfully hers, and Mr Justice Melchior had his life back. Well, with a bit of added colour, that's pretty much the story Jesus tells in Luke 18. And unusually for Luke, he explains to us the purpose of the parable. Verse 1, Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Jesus tells this parable to challenge us to be faithful in prayer as we wait for the coming of God's kingdom. And it seems to me that there are two simple lessons that he wants us to learn, two habits that we need to develop. The first is to pray with purpose, and the second is to pray with persistence. How can the Lord Jesus help us here to pray with purpose? We've encountered Jesus' teaching on prayer before in Luke's Gospel, particularly in chapter 11, but the emphasis here is slightly different. The sort of prayer Jesus is talking about here is born of desperate need. It is certainly true of this poor widow. No one needs to tell her to pester the unjust judge. She doesn't have any choice. She doesn't need a reminder from prayer mate that it's time to pray. She doesn't need a knot in her handkerchief, the knot's there in her heart. Every morning before she gets out of bed and faces the struggle of the day, she pesters the unjust judge because she absolutely has to. She needs the money and she needs it urgently. And in this parable, Jesus gives us a very striking description of why we need to pray. Come with me to verse 7. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? It's a picture of God's people as a people under pressure. Of course, that's precisely the reality facing many Christians in the world today particularly in Syria and Iraq. But Jesus' point, I think, is that to a greater or lesser extent, that is the situation facing us all. 
how the devil would love to pull off the ultimate exercise in ethnic cleansing and remove the people from the, of God from the face of the earth. We are a people under pressure, hounded, harried, helpless, until God steps in to rescue us. There's nothing new about this, of course. Do you remember Moses describing the experience of the people of God in Egypt? The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. It's a recurring theme through the Psalms as the psalmist cries out to God in desperation. So here's the question. Do I pray because I ought to? Or do I pray because I need to? Do I pray because I simply have to? Because I will burst if I don't? You see, behind this sort of praying lies a longing. It's a longing for the Lord Jesus to come back. It's a prayer that expresses a deep, deep satisfaction with things as they are, with the world as it is, with me as I am. It's a deep longing for the righting of wrongs, a deep yearning for the final vindication of God and of his people. Ooh, hang on, you say. Vindication. Is that really the sort of language we should be using? Well, it seems to me to be the kind of language the Lord Jesus is using here. Firstly, don't miss the context. Look at the passage immediately before our parable. You'll see from the section, the section from uh, chapter 17, verse 20, to the end of the chapter, is all about the coming of the kingdom and the return of the Son of Man. What will it be like for Christians living in these last days? Well, the short answer is tough, challenging. Have a quick look at uh, chapter 17, verse 22. The time is coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man... But you will not. We'll be under the cosh. We'll be feeling the pressure. We'll be crying out for the Lord Jesus to come back. And the harsh truth is that most of us will not see that. And then you can't miss the sting in the tail in our own passage as the Lord Jesus asks this extraordinary question in verse 8. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And sandwiched between these two references to the Lord Jesus' return is the parable of the persistent widow. It's only when Jesus comes back that wrongs will finally be righted, justice will finally be done, and the hearts of God's people will ultimately be at rest. So that's the context. And then secondly, notice that vindication is precisely the thought in the Lord Jesus' mind throughout the parable itself. Listen again to the cry of the widow in verse 3. Grant me justice against my adversary. Vindicate me. Oh, you say, maybe it's okay for this widow to pray for vindication. Maybe we ought to pray for other things. But the idea surfaces again in verses 7 and 8 as the Lord Jesus draws out the lessons from the parable. Will not God bring about justice for, vindicate his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice. He will vindicate them. And quickly. So this is not just about the widow. This is about us, all of us. However, we cut it, vindication is central to the meaning of this parable. Vindication is a bit of a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it involves the rescue and the restoration of the innocent, the persistent widow in this story. On the other, it involves the punishment of those who've done wrong, of the evil brothers-in-law, according to my version of the story. They're flip sides of the same coin. If the widow is to get the inheritance that is rightfully hers, then the brothers-in-law must be dispossessed of what does not belong to them. Vindication. 
Actually, isn't that what we pray for every time we pray the Lord's Prayer? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. What are we doing? We're praying for the king to come. We're praying for things to be put right. We're anticipating judgment day. We're longing for an age to come. And we know precisely what that will mean. The vindication of God's people and the condemnation of his enemies. Praying with purpose. Praying prayers that echo God's creation mandate to Adam and Eve. Prayers of purpose that anticipate our rule of a new earth in the glories to come. So I need to ask myself, to what extent is my prayer life shaped by a longing for those things to happen? Are are the prayers I articulate just the tip of an iceberg and below the waterline there are hidden depths in my heart that just yearn and ache for Jesus to come back? Do I yearn for everyone to see God's glory? Do I yearn for the day when evil will be overthrown forever and everything will be made new? I ask that question because if I've understood this parable aright, it's the sort of prayer the Lord Jesus longs to hear from me and from you. Prayer with purpose. But how can the Lord Jesus help us to pray with persistence? Well, come back to Luke's word of explanation. Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. This is the prayer of the persistent widow. Uh, Here is the Lord Jesus urging us to maintain this kind of prayer during what J.C. Ryle describes as the long, weary interval between the first and second comings of the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus is right. We are tempted to give up, aren't we? You young parents, you'll understand this. What do you do when your newborn cries at night? Well, the first few times you go rushing into the nursery, blue light flashing. But bit by bit, you get wise to the situation. And you start to ignore your screaming infant. And what happens? Well, mostly, but not always, the child finally realizes that its protests are in vain. Mum and Dad aren't coming tonight. The whale melts into a whimper. That's just the husband. (laughs) And finally everyone goes back to sleep. Well, in an upside-down kind of way, that's the sort of thing the Lord Jesus is talking about here. Sadly, we Christians can pray and pray, and nothing seems to happen. The Lord Jesus is not coming tonight. The world goes on pretty much the way it always has. Frankly, our prayers don't seem to make much difference. And what happens? The NIV says we're in danger of giving up. The ESV says something slightly more disturbing. We're in danger of losing heart. Why might that be? Because we're not sure that God's listening to us. And if he's listening, he doesn't seem to care. And if he does care, he doesn't seem to do very much about it. Maybe we don't matter to him quite as much as we thought we did. What happens to our prayer life? Slowly loses impetus and peters out. Of course we don't stop praying. We're evangelical Christians after all. But we just confine ourselves to small prayers. Domestic prayers. Prayers that Uncle Fred's ingrown toenail would be treated successfully and that Aunt Lily's cat would be safely rescued from the tree. Not that I'm in favour of ingrown toenails, as you understand. (laughs) Or cats being stuck up trees. But we lose our heart for praying the big prayers, the kingdom prayers, the faith-stretching prayers, the kind of prayers that are doomed to disaster unless God shows up and does something. Prayers about the salvation of the lost, Prayers about the glory of God. The Lord Jesus knows this. 
He knows that the kingdom is not going to come as quickly as you or I wish it would. He knows that we'll become impatient with God's big time scale. And he knows that as a result, we will be tempted to lose heart and give up. And that's why he tells us the story of the persistent widow. He wants us to see things differently, almost like a cartoon to see things from God's perspective. And what happens to our prayers when we see things from God's perspective? Well, three three things, very briefly. We will discover that God is good to all. Come back to the unjust judge. Do you see how the Lord Jesus draws his character in in deliberately outrageous terms? Verse 2, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. He doesn't take God seriously, so his judgments never reflect God's justice. He doesn't care about people, so his judgments never express the milk of human kindness. Frankly, he is everything a judge should not be. He is the judicial equivalent of a paedophile priest. But Jesus knows, and we know, that God is the very opposite of the unjust judge. He's the source of all justice. If he weren't, our whole universe would collapse into chaos. He's the source of all human kindness. We're kind to one another because he's kind. So if the widow thought it was worth carrying on her campaign for justice, how can we even think of giving up? To give up praying would be like imagining that God is even more despicable than the unjust judge. And that is unthinkable. No, says Jesus, pray on. Pray on because you know that God is good to all. Pray on because you know that God is gracious to us. The unjust judge regards the widow as a nuisance, an irritation, a pain in the proverbial. Any relationship she has with the judge is entirely negative. But did you notice how the Lord Jesus describes you and me? Verse 7. Will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones? His chosen ones. We don't come to God as strangers or mere supplicants. We come as chosen, holy, dearly loved. We come as redeemed, called by name, belonging to him, treasured by him. And the argument of the parable is that if an insignificant widow and an absolute nobody can get justice out of an unjust judge, how much more will we see our prayers answered by a loving Heavenly Father? Pray on, says Jesus, because God is gracious to us. And the third thing the Lord Jesus says to us, to help us to keep praying, is to pray persistently because God is patient with the lost. The last part of verse 7 has taxed the best of translators. The NIV renders it, will he keep putting them off? The ESV is something similar, will he delay long over them? Frame the question in those terms and the answer we instinctively jump to is no. Of course he won't. God will answer our prayers and he'll do it quickly. The snag is, 2,000 years on, he hasn't. Other translators translate the phrase like this, will he not be patient with them? Patient. We encounter that word in 2 Peter chapter 3. Peter's facing the accusation that there doesn't seem to be much sign that Jesus is coming back. Oh, that rings a bell, doesn't it? Where's the evidence, asked the critics? And Peter responds like this, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises as you understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. There's a reason for the delay. God is patient. And here's the point. Coming back to our parable, the Lord Jesus calls us to be patient too. For the same reason, the unjust judge delays responding to the widow because he wants to avoid getting involved. Father God responds to, fails to respond to the cries of us for exactly the opposite reason. He is involved. He wants as many people as possible. 
to have as many opportunities as possible to come to the Lord Jesus, to discover the joys of sins forgiven, to feel the warm embrace of being drawn into God's big family. Why has God allowed the sun to rise on a world that breaks his heart again today? Because there are the lost to be saved. To put it starkly, when it comes to judgment day, God votes for the lost rather than for us. Isn't that amazing? He votes to show mercy to the lost rather than justice to the found. And that's why we have to wait. Jesus' point is that when we understand this, we won't let the delay put us off. In fact, when we understand this, the direction of our prayers will change. We'll be drawn to pray along the grain of God's grace. We'll recommit ourselves to praying for the lost too, unlike Jonah, the world's worst missionary. Our prayers will be less about the restoration of our comforts and our privileges and our rights and more about the success of the gospel. We'll be willing to keep going, to keep investing our money, to keep making friends for heaven because we know that's how we hasten the day of the Lord's return. He wants lost people to be saved and we want lost people to be saved too. So when we pray... We're to pray with purpose and with persistence because God is good to all, gracious to us, patient with the lost. But that leaves us with the sting in the tail in verse 8. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? However, it's a strong word. It introduces a, a degree of doubt into the passage. Almost as though the Lord Jesus, in spite of the story he's just told and the incentives he's just given, is not sure how we're going to respond. He knows that prayer is the thermometer of our faith. It's one of the vital signs, isn't it? Just as everyone in the delivery suite checks to see that the brave baby is breathing, so the Lord Jesus checks to see that his people are praying. If I have faith, I must pray. If I don't pray, you may question if I have faith. So, dear brothers and sisters, let's ask ourselves the big question. If the Lord Jesus returned today, would he find faith in the FIEC? Planting churches, yes. Training gospel workers, yes. Pastoring ministry families, yes. Revitalizing struggling churches, maybe. But the sign he's looking for is this. Are we praying? Praying with purpose for his kingdom to come, for the harvest to be gathered in, for the glory of God to be revealed. Praying with persistence because we know that God is good to all, gracious to us, amazingly patient with the lost. Praying not because we should, but because we must. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith among us? When the Son of Man comes. The whole context of this passage is the forgotten truth that Jesus is coming back. Yes, God is patient. He waits and he waits and he waits. But he will not wait forever. By its very definition, patience has its limits. In the second last verse of the Bible, appearing on the screen, the Lord Jesus makes this promise to his people. He says, yes, I am coming soon. To which there can only be one response. Why don't we say it together? Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.